Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala abdillahi wa rasulihi Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. May Allah bless you all. I want to acknowledge the youngsters sitting in front of me here. I would have loved to shake all your hands. That's why they call me shake anyway. But nonetheless, nonetheless, inshallah, we wouldn't like to shake you. Uh, and inshallah, you and I know that that's humanly impossible by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is love, there is care, there is concern for the Ummah. And the whole idea is for us to become better Muslims and better people. That's the whole idea. I'm not here for my own selfish purpose. I'm here for us as an Ummah. I'm here because I care for every one of you, boys and girls, men and women, the elderly, the young, we are part of one Ummah. I have attended in the last two days a beautiful convention entitled or themed healing the ummah the fact that we need to talk about healing the ummah already means there is some bleeding that's happening in order for us to talk about healing you don't look at a person who's healthy and say may allah grant you a good healing healing from what I can't just say, brother, may Allah cure you. Cure me from what? But I can say, may Allah continue to grant you good health. May Allah protect you. May Allah never let you see a day of illness, sickness, hardship, disease, negativity, etc. May Allah bless us with all what I've said. Protect us from the negatives. Amen. So, you and I know that we are more than 2 billion on earth as Muslimin. If we cared for one another, no one would dare harm even the weakest from amongst us. But because that's not the case, that's why people are being bullied, attacked, harmed. Our brothers and sisters in Palestine, it's impossible for us to deliver a talk and not mention them in these days. Something is going on that is unprecedented, unbelievable. May Allah protect them. May Allah grant them goodness. May Allah grant them victory. May Allah Almighty truly forgive our shortcomings, the inability that we have. We as an ummah, have failed them. There's no way that you can deny that. We have failed them. So when you look at one another today, as our brother was introducing the masjid that I'm in right now, Palmer's Green, he said, we are a diverse community. I love to hear that. But with that diversity, is there love enough to be able to stand up for the weakest from us? If the answer is yes, you have headed in the right direction. And if the answer is, well, you know, this brother, these guys are a little bit this way. Those guys are a little bit that way. Those people are not as grand. These have a lot of arrogance. Those are proud. These have a problem. Those think they know too much. Then we have a problem in the ummah. We're all different. I see different ethnicities, different races in our midst. Wallahi, if you don't feel the bond of La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there is a lot that you still have to work on. You must feel the bond. Look at the brother sitting next to you. In the sisters, look at the sister sitting next to you. Are you prepared to smile at them, greet them? Are you prepared to help them if need be? Would you like to know the hardship they are going through? In a lot of cases, the answer is no. I'm here for me, myself, and I. I come here, do salah, and go. Why do you think we have to do salah in jama'ah? Because Allah wants you to know each other. Otherwise, he would have told you, just read at home. He wants you to know, to become acquainted. It's your test. Did you meet someone? Yes. Do you know that sister is struggling? No, I don't. Well, that means you're not a good member of your community. You should immediately know 
these people are struggling there are so many widows in this community there are so many orphans in this community there are so many homeless in this community they shouldn't be homeless anyway but there are so many people who are refugees in this community there are so many who are looking for jobs in this community there are so many who perhaps have lost limbs and don't have good health in this community you should know the stats you need to know it that's when you're a healthy community no matter where they come from so what you are my brother i care for you you are my sister i care for you inshallah i will stand for you i will be there for you i will not say statements that will hurt you and harm you because i talk about the ummah healing how can i talk about healing the ummah when i myself am a problem within the ummah i am the source of pain and hardship for others if that's the case i need to stop causing pain to others in your own home in your house how many sentences and statements of goodness do you say to those whom you live with the last few days i've made people promise that every day we promise we will say at least 10 sentences of kindness goodness love and affection and positivity to those whom we live with are you ready to make the same promise are you ready to make the same promise I hope that's a genuine inshallah. Because a lot of the guys are saying inshallah. You know what that means. Brother, will you be here at 5 o'clock for Fajr? They say inshallah. That means if I wake up, perhaps maybe, maybe not. If you say 10 sentences of kindness, goodness to those you live with, whoever they are, from your relatives, your families, and the same gender for as long as you're mahram obviously the reason i say same gender is because some people living in haram they say well sheikh told us to tell you i love you you look so good and so please chill please relax understand it's got to be halal right it's got to be we're talking of your parents your brothers your sisters your folks your in-laws whoever else it may be good sentences be conscious of it do you know why man is created in a way that he's he easily falls prey to negativity. But in order to look at the positives, he has to be reminded. Can I give you a good example from the Quran? I'll tell you something. Allah says, If you are going to count the favors of Allah Almighty, you won't be able to count all of them. That's what it means. Why did Allah have to tell you that? He had to tell you that because the opposite is true. What's the opposite? If you are to try and count the negatives in your life, you can count them. But Allah didn't tell you that because he knows you already counting the negatives without him telling you and you already feel overwhelmed by those negatives thinking that that's the end of your life. But if I were to ask you, my brother, Billahi alayk, tell me by Allah, how many major issues do you have in your life of negativity? What you might say, I don't have a job. Big problem, right? That's one problem. I'm struggling with my health. That's another problem. I just went through a divorce. That's another problem. I'm having problems perhaps accessing my own children. That's another problem. How many did you count so far? Four. But to you, that's the end of the world, right? Allah says, when you try and count the positives that I gave you, it's unbelievable how you will never be able to count all of them i have eyes alhamdulillah i can see i have a nose i can breathe mashallah i have lips i have a tongue i have saliva i my food digests as i chew it i have teeth subhanallah allah doesn't charge you rent for your teeth imagine if you had to be charged rent for using your mouth to eat we'd be swallowing our food so quick why i can't pay more than two quid right it can't happen. Allah says, no, enjoy it. But thank Allah. When you put food in your mouth, you say, Bismillah. When you're done with your food, you say, Alhamdulillah. Why? Allah says, that's it. I don't want more than gratitude from you. Come for your prayer. Learn to dress appropriately. Learn to work on your weaknesses. Be a good person. Have good company. Have good friends. But more important than having good friends is for you to be a good friend. We all say, brother, make sure your friends are good. <laughs> In fact, if anything, you're, you're the bad one. You need to make sure you're a good person to your friends. Become a good person. Don't engage in such behavior that will bring about loss for you and your friends. Not at all. 
So in order to help us, Allah does a favor. What's the favor? Allah says, well, you know what I'm going to do for you? The days are not all going to be the same. I'll make some days better than other days to give you a chance to reflect, right? So which is the best day of the week? Which is the best day of the week? Yawmul Jum'ah. Khayru yawmin talat fihi shamsu. The hadith says the best day in which the sun has risen, a Friday. Subhanallah. The days are not the same. You can't say Wednesday and Thursday and Friday are all the same. No. Allah says Friday is a unique day. I want to tell you one thing about Friday, just a reminder, there is a time, there is a time on a Friday when your supplication or dua will be accepted. When is that time? We don't know the exact time. Because it's a blessing that Allah doesn't tell you the exact time. If he told it, we would all wait exactly 4.59. Oh Allah, grant me, grant me, grant me. Five o'clock, we're done. What would happen? After that, we forget about Allah. I wanted my things. I quickly... For that reason, Allah leaves it without exactly telling you the moment. But he'll give you an idea. I know there is a time on a Friday when du'as are accepted. So what do I need to do? You need to start making your du'a if it's dear for you from the morning to the evening. Repeat it every moment. If you're really crazy about something you want, right? Then what? I want to tell you, Allah says, not all moments of the day and night will be the same. The morning has its virtue. The evening has its virtue. Immediately after Maghrib has its virtue. But there is the most virtuous time of the 24 hours. Is the time off? The time off? The Hajjud, yes. You know the time. I always tell people who have a problem, I say, if you have a problem and you haven't gotten up for tahajjud, you actually do not have a problem. If you have a problem and you haven't gotten up for tahajjud to cry to Allah, to supplicate and to ask Him, you actually do not have a problem. Because Allah says, at that time, Allah is actually calling, saying, who has... Who is asking me so I can give him? Who is seeking forgiveness so that I can forgive him? Who is repenting so that I can accept that repentance? And what are we doing? We have a major problem, but we're sleeping. You don't really have a problem. Because if you did, you'd wake up and say, Oh Allah, I have a problem. I'm asking you. Please give me. Oh Allah, forgive me. I'm seeking forgiveness. I'm the one seeking forgiveness. That's the time. So the time of the day, not all moments are equal. Not all days are equal. In the week, a Friday is the better day in the month which are the days that are better who knows 13 14 15 in terms of fast if allah didn't give value to those days by making it a sunnah for you and i to fast we would have said the days are all the same but you fast on those days if you can it's not compulsory if you do so great virtue what is the virtue do you want to know you get a reward of having fasted the whole month because a good deed is multiplied by 10, three days multiplied by 10, 30 days, that's the whole month. I got a reward. Similarly, the months are not all the same. So which is the most powerful from the months? Ramadan, round the corner. A few more, two weeks remaining. Ramadan, round the corner. So why does Allah have fluctuation? in the days and the months. In Ramadan, not all of the days are the same. Not all of the nights are the same. In Dhul Hijjah, we have a season where the days are the highest of the days. And in Ramadan, we have a season where the nights are the highest of the nights. So when someone says the first 10 days of Dhul Hijjah, they're talking of the day. And when someone says the last 10 days of Ramadan, they're talking of the nights. They're talking of the nights. So there's no contradiction there. There is one night known as Laylatul Qadr, the night of decree, within the last 10 nights of Ramadan. Again, for the same reason, we don't know exactly when it is.
We just were given an idea. The last 10 nights, you look for them. Some of the scholars say, any one of those nights, but there is a narration that suggests that it's one of the odd nights. And there is another narration that suggests that it's one of the odd nights from the second half of the last 10 nights, which makes it 27, 29, perhaps not necessarily. But because of these narrations, a lot of people think 27th, that's the night. 29th, that's probably the next best, and so on. Fair enough, but that's not accurate. It's not a given to say that is the night. Because Allah wants you to cry from the 20th, 21st, all the way down. And who knows if you're going to make it to the 20th, 21st. So you've got to cry all of the nights. And who knows if you're going to make it to Ramadan. So you have to seek forgiveness here and now. I don't even know if I'm going to walk out of this masjid. May Allah forgive all of us. May Allah grant us goodness. May Allah grant us sustenance. Each one of us wants a good job, right? These young people here, you're going to school perhaps, right? What are you doing? You're learning for what? In order to be able to graduate and earn some money. Some of you might be entrepreneurs. Some of you might have a good business. Some of you might work online. Some of you might have, subhanAllah, a job. You might become doctors. You might become something meaningful that will help community but help your pocket at the same time. It's not wrong. Nonetheless, don't forget that's temporary. It's very short-lived. You're only going to be doing that for a few years. 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, or 60. Not even there. Say, for example, you become a doctor. What age do you graduate and start working? Maybe. The earliest from among them, perhaps 25 years old, right? And now you've graduated, you start working as a doctor. When are you, when, what is the age of retirement in this country? 60. 60, right? Some saying 60. Those who are already 60 are saying 65. Those who are 65 are saying 70. Mashallah, whatever it is. Nonetheless, you will be able to practice up to a cap. After that, what happens? You have to diversify. You have to understand. Look, you know what? I'm, I'm going to be retired. Alhamdulillah, I did my whatever I could. Now what? Now you need to know, did I pack away some of that money for the hereafter? If I did, Alhamdulillah, when I close my eyes, Wallahi, I'm going to go to a better place. I know it. Why? Because Allah promised me. And I have hope in the mercy of Allah. Oh, Wallahi, I'm going to go to a better place. Shaitan will come and make you think, well, you did a lot of sins. I know I did, but I have a Lord who is far greater than any sin that I've committed. And I sought his forgiveness and he promised me that I'm going to forgive you. So I have hope more in his mercy than anything else. Mu'min, you die. Where do you think you're going to go? Where are you going to go when you die? Where do you think you're going to go? Jannah, straight, inshallah. By the will of Allah, I'm confident. Yes, I'm worried. I am. I have a concern. Yes. So what do I do with the worry and concern? It makes me say, oh Allah, forgive me. Imagine if you, if you live every day as per what Allah told you, you will start the morning with Salatul Fajr. Say that was your last day. How did you start it? You started it with Salatul Fajr. When you say Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, what is the sunnah? Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah. What does that mean? I seek your forgiveness, O oh Allah. I seek your forgiveness, O oh Allah. I seek your forgiveness, O oh Allah. Thrice after the salah. In the salah, you already sought forgiveness because you say, Allahumma inni zalamtu nafsi dhulman kathira. O oh Allah, I've wronged myself in a big way. And none forgives sins besides you. So forgive me a forgiving from you. Warhamni and have mercy upon me. You are the one who's most forgiving, most merciful. And then you say, Salam alaykum. Salam alaykum. Allah. Right? How beautiful is it? You started your day that way because it's the norm of starting your day that way every single day of your life. What were you doing? The day you're going to die, you, it is registered and recorded. This man's soul was taken away at 8.50 in the morning. He had just finished the morning prayer. This is what he said. This is what he did. And it was written, we should take his soul away, meaning the angels. So the angel of death comes and he takes your soul away. Are you a happy man or are you a sad man? Tell me, you started your day in what way? In a beautiful way. The problem is when you spent the night in sin and you didn't even get up for Fajr, may Allah strengthen us. And then comes 8.50, the angel of death comes. What do you think he's going to do? 
May Allah never let that happen to us. I mean, you did something wrong in your life. You're still alive. There is hope. Turn today to Allah. Enjoy the rest of your life by becoming a content person. And contentment is only achieved by connecting with Allah. There's no other way. There's no other chance. You can be happy temporarily. You achieved something. You won a competition and they gave you a million pounds. Right? Wouldn't you like that to happen? What will it bring for you? To make you happy. But contentment, no. I did a little research a few years back. You might want to do it again. Of those who won millions in lotteries. And study them 10 years after that. Did you know? Most of them were suicidal, sad, depressed, bankrupt, upset, broken families, divorced, and some of them even committed suicide. But you won a lottery, 10 million. If I told you, brother, if I give you 10 million today, what's going to happen? Wow, 10 million. Should we tell you something that is better than everything they bring together in terms of material wealth? The fadl of Allah, the virtue of Allah, the mercy of Allah. When Allah has mercy on you by allowing you to worship Him, Wallahi, it's better than everything they amass. That's the reason why the hadith tells you, get up early and you need to fulfill your two units of sunnah of fajr. And we promise you it is better for you than the whole wide world and whatever it contains. Rak'ata al-fajri khayrum min dunya wa ma fiha. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, says the two units of Fajr are better for you than the whole world and whatever it has. Allah wants you to get up early and as you get up first thing, voluntary prayer. Those two units being spoken about are voluntary, but they are very important. So don't miss them. The most important from among the voluntary prayers are the two units of Fajr. So don't miss them. Subhanallah. This is the favor of Allah. Imagine I told you Allah says in the Quran, the virtue of Allah, the mercy of Allah, the gift of Allah, of the deen and whatever you have and the closeness to Allah is far better than the material amassing. What are you going to get? It's going to be depleted. When you came on earth, what did you come with? Nothing. As soon as you came, they had to wrap you. They call it a receiver, receiving blanket. You know, those of you who have children, mashallah. You know what's a receiving blanket and those of you who are children you might still feel the comfort of some of those blankets right i know kids who still hold the earliest blankets of theirs until they grow to about 10 years old just as a comforter something they just hold when they're sleeping it helps them not wrong or right it's just a point of mention but you were covered when you came you came with nothing when you go at least you're given the honor of a shroud that's it but you don't go with anything that happened on earth besides your deeds. The wealthiest from amongst us, what did they go with? Wallahi, if they were mu'mineen, muslimin, they went with a shroud. Shroud meaning the kafan. They were covered in the cloth, right? And they were carried, taken. What about their money? I promise you, sometimes the more you leave, the greater the chance of your family splitting up as a result of wars because you left so much. If you leave behind 200 pounds, trust me, your kids will distribute it properly and they will, mashallah, tabarakallah, they will give each one, here's your 20 pounds, this your 21 pounds, whatever it might be, and we're done. We're happy, and there you go. Some might say, it's okay, you know, no, it's not that, you have to take it. But I'm going to tell you, when you leave behind 200 million pounds for the 1 million extra, the two brothers are fighting each other. Why? Because no ways, there's a million, no chance, it's not, that's mine, this is no ways, not this, not this, not that. Subhanallah, you're fighting over someone else's money. Someone else's money. You know, one of the worst things I ever heard was when a youngster told me, my father's rich, I'm just waiting for him to die, inshallah, I'll be a rich man. What are you talking about? How can you say that? I heard a young guy say this, and I said, do you know that if that happens, who knows, the entire empire might come crashing and crumbling and you will have nothing. So don't ever pray that way. Rather say, Alhamdulillah, Allah has blessed my father. Let me get close to Allah and do a lot of goodness. And may Allah grant him a good, long, healthy life so that at least 
we can all benefit from it and while we are benefiting from it i can concentrate on studying the deen and perhaps maybe teaching and perhaps maybe doing something good or helping the poor or whatever else it may be alhamdulillah good things not negatives so going back to ramadan like i said the days are different the nights are different allah's created them different there's a reason i'm getting to that but there is another thing not every place has the same value your house and my house does it have the same value as this house why whose house is this the house of allah you can have a management you can have people these are volunteers these are just custodians they're just helping out they will be rewarded it's not an easy task but the house belongs to allah that's the reason why anyone who walks into here no matter who you are you're welcome you're welcome if you enter here respectfully you're welcome we will never turn you away because this is not my house not your house it's the house of allah your maker you're welcome and when someone walks into here my brothers and sisters don't ever make them feel unwelcome if they are dressed inappropriately very politely let them know the etiquette of coming to the house of allah maybe they don't but when you're sitting next to a person no matter what their standing is what their color is what their ethnicity is make them feel welcome because when you make them feel welcome allah will welcome you into paradise there are some masjids and i'm sure i get the vibe from this masjid that they're very welcoming you come in my brother my sister mashallah welcome what's the issue what's happening mashallah we'd like to help you we're so happy that you're here inshallah we see you again that's the vibe that's the masjid we have a field adjacent to this particular masjid when i saw it i felt if i was young i'd make use of this field i'd be kicking the ball this way and that way time for salah can read salah come back to the ball why not it's not wrong to play but it's wrong to overplay he says we do that every Saturday. Mashallah. You see, are you guys making use of the field here? Mashallah. Young people, you're supposed to say, yes, we do this and we do that. Now, what a lovely place. What a beautiful place. But don't love your game more than the love you have for Allah. That's something. Allah comes first then the game. I love my game. I love it dearly, but I love my Allah even more dearly. So I'll play, but I'll do the right thing. There are a lot of good players today on earth who are good ambassadors for the deen. Some of them, they may not be that strong in their faith, but still the fact that they're Muslim and they're upright and they're trying to do the right thing, sometimes they can actually allow or they can actually be used by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to let the message of the deen subtly get to much more people than a scholar who's going to sit in the masjid. Why? Because they know this guy is a Muslim. I can take so many names, but I don't want to do that because if I miss out your favorite, then I'm in trouble. Right? And by the way, there was a match being played today somewhere. I don't know who won or who lost, but I don't even want to know. Astaghfirullah. Someone already said, <laughs> who won? <laughs> no problem. So long as we win on the Day of Judgment, I'm fine. Right? What's the point of saying Liverpool won? Come on the Day of Judgment, there's no mention of Liverpool. Right? Say, where's my team? Say, what, what's your team? My team is the team of Sahaba radiallahu And the people I used to go to the masjid with. I used to go to the masjid with a group and a team of people. Here we are on the day of judgment all together. May Allah resurrect us together on the day of judgment with Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I love the faces I'm seeing in front of us. Wallahi, pray that Allah gather us in a similar way in Jannah. Show concern, show concern. The places are not all the same. The masjid has greater value. That's why there is a hadith that says a special shade will be granted from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to seven categories of people. One of them is a person whose heart is actually stuck in the masjid. It's always in the masjid. I'm always remembering the masjid, going there, frequenting there, doing something about it, contributing and so on. You know, when they put up a masjid, like this something i always think of that embarrasses me 
And I need to share it because it's good to hear this. I use the masjid, I come in, I pray. That is my greatest connection ever, is my connection with my maker. Where does it happen? It happens every time throughout the day because I'm a Muslim. But the closest I can ever get to my Lord is in sujood. It's a hadith. It says, Akrabu ma yakunul abdu li rabbihi wa huwa sajid. The closest that a slave is to his Lord is when he's in prostration. So where do I prostrate? In the masjid. Guess what? I think to myself, the light is on, the heater is on, the fans are on, the microphone's on. There are bills being paid, there are people who work here, the imam is here. I've never paid a penny towards all of this. I didn't give one cent. I came and I benefited. I came and I chilled here. I sat in the corner, I used some of the mushafs here. I took out my shoes, I used the water. I came in and I ran the water until it was hot and I used it. Someone paid the bill. Someone paid, someone painted. Someone is paying for the electricity and for everything else and I didn't, I didn't. How much do you think it would cost for one prayer for you to come in? A few pounds. Do you know that? Who paid it? Someone, some amazing guy whom Allah put in his heart or her heart to say, let's give towards the masjid. They gave 20 grand, for example. And what happened? They got the rewards of so many people's prayers without knowing, without you realizing. And we who have never paid a penny, we're the ones who say, it's too cold, it's too hot. This door is open, that door is closed. This light is too bright, the other one is, this screen is not, this, my brother, the screen and all of that, did you pay a penny towards it? The guys who pay don't make a noise, it's the guys who don't pay who are making a noise. You follow what I'm saying? The question I have is, shouldn't we start paying a little bit? I try my best sometimes to say, in my local masjid where I am, I don't want to count how many prayers I had and give a pound each or two pounds each, but if I had to, you'd be giving minimum five to ten quid a day. And if that was the case, the imam would have such a job that our kids would never want to be doctors again. Why? What's his take home salary? 200,000 a year. Allahu Akbar, who wants to be an imam? See, the hands are going up. MashaAllah. May Allah grant us goodness. A lot of us want to be Imams knowing that that's not what it is. The Imams are probably the least paid and the most greatly rewarded by Allah. It shouldn't be that you least paid. I know a community that pays the Imam so well that everyone respects that Imam. And even the rich and famous need to wait a moment before they can even talk to him. Because you know what? Hey, everything happens discipline, They're given value. The minute the imam, you throw a five pounder at him, mashallah, what do you think he's going to do? The little kids think that this guy is nothing. It shouldn't be that way. Respect your imam. The day you realize that imam is actually a leader of the community, he leads you in prayer, his value is great. You look after the house of Allah. Allah has accepted your money in that house. That's why he took it. It's going to go without you. It's a train that moves. It's going to keep moving. Whether you're on it or not on it, it will still go. Whether you gave, contributed or not today or any other day towards your masjid, for example, someone's still going to pay the light for it. It will still be on next month and the following month and the following month. Something goes wrong. Someone will put it. But was it ever you? That's the question you ask yourself. If not, please take at least half a pound. Put it in the box. Running of the masjid. Pledge 10 pound a month. It will make a big difference. We are more than two, three thousand today. Those who are regular might be a fraction of us, but please, your money is accepted. Why do I say this? We put money in our own houses. Ask those who paid for a house, built a house, or have their own houses, or even renting houses. Don't you agree? We put in furniture, we put in things, we change and upgrade our own house. And I just told you, you all agree, a house that is much more valuable than ours is the house of Allah. We didn't put anything into the house of Allah. Nothing happened. Then, not all places are the same. So you find Mecca and Medina are given greater value. Medina Munawwara, the exact place of the burial of the Prophet Muhammad wasallam, has been given value by Allah. It's considered one of the most, if not the most valuable place. You have the Kaaba, exactly where the Kaaba is, valuable place. 
the masajid, the houses of Allah, the best and the highest in terms of reward is the one in Mecca, closely followed by the one in Medina. So if you go there, isn't it something blessed? I was there two days ago and I'm going back there tomorrow by the will of Allah. I just came to Palmer's Green. Allah bless you guys. I'm serious about going back there tomorrow. But my brothers and sisters, not all places are the same. Allah has done this because he wants to give all of us a chance to reflect, to repent, to turn, to change, to, to, to become closer to him, to connect, and to be given a chance to do more and more and more. So Ramadan is not once a lifetime like Hajj. Hajj is so powerful that it will result in you being as pure as the day you were born and even purer from one aspect. What is that aspect? I can tell you. The aspect is when you were born, your slate was clean. And you go for Hajj. Your slate is clean, but it has something on it. It is selective formatting. All the sins are wiped out. But what about the good deeds? Does Hajj wipe out your good deeds or your bad deeds? Your bad deeds. So the, the bad deeds are gone. I've got so many good deeds, that's even better than the day I was born. Because when I was born, I neither had good nor bad. It was all okay. clean. So from that angle, from that aspect, you will never lose your good deeds by the will of Allah. You go for Hajj, it's powerful, but it's once a, once a lifetime. Ramadan keeps coming back because man needs it. Repetition is very good for a Muslim and a human being. You need to do things again and again. Just like how you need to eat. How many times do you eat a day? How many? On average. People saying two, some saying three. Agree? Why do you need to eat more than once a day? And why do you need to eat every single day? Because Allah wants you to fill the cavity. And Allah wants you to energize, to get the energy, to be able to do something and do something more and beyond. So you eat, you get hungry, you use the loo, akramakumullah, and you know what happens? You come back to eat more. And then what happens? You use the energy, you get hungry again, use the loo, akramakumullah, you come back for more. And it keeps going. If you don't eat, you become weak. Similarly, if you don't connect with Allah through your five daily salah, your connection with Allah becomes weak. And if it becomes weak, shaitan comes. What does he do? He makes you lose hope in the mercy of Allah. He makes you think that you're not forgiven. He makes you think that, you know what, it's not important. He makes you think that what's the point in all of this? And he makes you drift away from Allah. And you don't realize before you know it, you're very, very, very far because you didn't keep repeating the prayer every single day. When Ramadan comes, make sure you make use of it. It's a season. It's a sale. What is on sale? Forgiveness and reward. Allah is forgiving anyone and everyone who seeks forgiveness more in Ramadan than out of Ramadan. So I will seek forgiveness from today because I don't know if I'm going to make it to Ramadan. But if Allah allows me to see Ramadan, I take it seriously. You know what problem we have in community and society? A guy will tell his girlfriend, you know what? Come 11th of March, that's it, I can't see you for a month. What did you just say? I promise you. He says, no, but it's Ramadan. I respect Ramadan. What do you mean I respect Ramadan? You committed zina on the 10th, and then you waited for the, for the 11th of April to commit zina again. Is that Ramadan? He said, yeah, but I respect and honor Ramadan. What did you do? It's supposed to change your life. People become good Muslims in Ramadan. Allah, only Ramadan. The guy's listening to his beat and he's shaking his head like you can't imagine. And it's such big doof that he doesn't know. This way and that way. And he's moving himself. And, and it happens to the sisters as well. And subhanAllah, astaghfirullah. You know what? And then they say, no, Ramadan. Ramadan. So suddenly the scarf comes out. The beat box goes to the side. The shisha goes to the side. What else? The e-cigarettes go away. The weed becomes tajweed. <laughs> I can promise you. What else? Everything. If 
that's only going to happen for one month, you lost the plot. You've lost the plot. I'm not telling you that you should not do it in Ramadan, meaning you should not do the abstention in Ramadan. But I am telling you, it's supposed to be life changing. You come out of Ramadan, it's supposed to be I'm a better person. You know what? Before Ramadan, I used to do a lot. Alhamdulillah, Allah guided me. And now Ramadan's done. It really helped me so much. And Alhamdulillah. A sign of your accepted fasting is if your life changed. Just like a sign of an accepted Hajj is if your life changed. Something needs to have changed in your life, then your Ramadan was accepted. Something needs to have changed in your life, then your Hajj was accepted. What's the point of a guy going for Hajj? He goes for Hajj and he comes back, he's back into the same vibe. He's in the club the first day after the Hajj, he's in the nightclub, you know. They call it popping, you know. Astaghfirullah. Whatever he's doing, sniffing, whatever it is to sniff. And he says, I went for Hajj, bro, it was busy, it was lovely, man. You know what? He just went on a holiday, that's what happened. If you go for Hajj and come back with a changed life, something changed in you, and you became more conscious of Allah, inshallah, you are a person whose Hajj was accepted. Do you know in many cultures, many cultures, something lovely is said to a person who's made Hajj. They put a title in front of his name. What do they call him? Al-Hajj. Al-Hajj, Al-Hajj. It happens in many countries, many cultures. Why do they call you Al-Hajj? The Haji, because they want to keep reminding you, you made Hajj. So now when you're moving around, you're looking at all the people you're not supposed to look at, you know who I'm talking about, right? And you're just looking and saying, mm, they say Haji, Haji, and you've got to say, stop for Allah, look down and say, nah, I did Hajj. Right? That's how it should be. You're a human. Look, if you're looking, if you're appreciating the opposite sex, there is nothing abnormal about you, my brother. You know what? You're supposed to, as a mu'min, Understand that this is the first gaze that says, Subhanallah, Astaghfirullah. Look down and say, La ilaha illallah. Don't, don't look back, you're a believer. Because why? It is said that's an arrow. An arrow, you're gonna, it's gonna give you a sleepless night. You're gonna start following something you're not supposed to. You're gonna waste money, emotions, you're gonna mess your life and everybody else's life. Just look down and appreciate what Allah's given you. Wallahi. It's not abnormal to look. It's abnormal to continue looking. And it's abnormal to continue following. I mean, imagine you see, let me give you an example. A Lamborghini cruise by with a nice sun. And it's gone by. What, what do the young people do? Nowadays, even the older ones. They look and say, subhanAllah, you see that car, bro? You see, take out your camera, quickly take a picture. That's a car. It's okay. You can look. You don't have to lower your gaze. It's, a, it's just a car. You can even take a picture, inshallah. Subhanallah, Subhanallah, when you're looking at other things, you need to understand, who are you? Where are you? Where did you come from? Allah wants goodness for you. Do you really think if there was goodness in it, Allah would say it's haram? Allah would not say it's haram if there was goodness in it. Allah wants you to appreciate that which is halal. So if you're going to start appreciating what's haram, you're never ever going to appreciate halal. Allah gives you Ramadan, change your life, connect with the Quran. You know what? Tell me, Ramadan is the month of what? It's the month of what? Fasting. And it's the month of? Forgiveness. And it's the month of? The Quran. And it's the month of? Charity and giving. Generosity, right? And it's the month of? We can go on and on and on. It's the month of prayer as well. Qiyam, right? It's the month of what else? Freedom from the fire, the month of dua, supplication. Imagine it is a month. All of us have just agreed that it's the month of forgiveness, the month of dua, the month of fasting, the month of this. Look at the gift of Allah. It is round the corner. Start changing from now and promising Allah, Oh Allah, I am definitely going to make the most of this beautiful month of Ramadan that's coming. We promise? We promise? That's quite a good inshallah. We hope, may Allah Almighty grant us goodness. You know, I could go on and on and on. I just realized 45 minutes are up. When I walked in, I told the brother, I said, you know what, I'll speak for half an hour. But I've been speaking for 45 minutes. It's even more. We ask Allah Almighty to grant us goodness, to grant us ease, to bless us. Let's take our days seriously. Let's connect with Allah. Let's try and attend the dhurus of the scholars. You know, 
there are different types of scholars. I, I think I've never said this before, maybe the way I'm about to say it, but I think I'm going to say this to end. Not everyone is a teacher who's going to teach students. And not everyone is a student who's going to sit at the feet of a scholar. And it's not fard to become a scholar or a student of a scholar. It's not absolutely compulsory for everyone to know everything about their deen. But there are certain things you are supposed to know. They are known as ma huwa ma'lumun min ad-deen bil-darura. That which you definitely need to know about your religion. Those things, everyone needs to know them. So you know the pillars of Islam, Iman, you know your Aqeedah, your Tawheed, you know you worship Allah alone and so on. These are the pillars of Iman and the pillars of Islam and so on. And you know what's halal and haram. You know how to wash up your tahara, your cleanliness and so on. These are things you have to know. But some details, the majority of things are details. You don't need to know them. So not everyone needs to be a scholar. Remember that. So for a lot of us, we need to be moved and motivated to do what we already know we're supposed to be doing because we know we're not doing it. So for us, we need to gather with good friends. We need to come about to attend talks that will motivate us and so on. And we should try and increase our knowledge. So it would be a bonus for us to be able to attend the tafsir lessons. I want to know what the Quran says in detail. What do I do? Go and attend the tafsir lessons of a reliable scholar in your area. Go to the masjid, ask the imam, Sheikh, we would love to have a lesson of tafsir. And I'm going to bring with me 20 of my friends. The imam will say, okay, no problem. We teach you once a week, every Friday. At this particular time, we have this time. And bring those friends. Don't just come and there's two people sitting there. And the imam, you know what? His own family members are more than those two. I'd rather sit with my kids. I've got 10 kids and grandkids and so many. Mashallah, I sit with the whole army. When we were on the day of Eid, the last I counted, we had about 75 people, all my family. I'd rather just sit with my family and teach them. And I've taught more people than, than, than I could have imagined. But at the same time, you know when you make an effort to bring others, Allah Almighty will grant you barakah and blessings because you cared for others. My friend, come, let's go. Let's go to the masjid, 20 minutes. Look, this evening I'm here. I'm seeing young boys, mashallah. I'm sure there are a lot of young sisters as well. Alhamdulillah, I'm super happy and ha delighted for you, your connection, inshallah, with Allah. What did I say in my speech? So not all the scholars give da'wah in exactly the same method. Some are teaching. Some might go out and do street da'wah. Have you seen the street da'wah guys who put on a table and call people towards Allah? Some teach in a madrasa, alif and ba and Quran. They are not wrong. None of these are wrong. They are all doing something important. So wherever you fit in, fit in. Don't talk bad about the other guys. Just because you're a student, and you can sit at the feet of someone who's giving you the details of fiqh and aqidah and all of that. Doesn't mean that the guy who's doing the street down and put out a table is doing nothing. He's doing something very important as well. And then there are others who are doing dawah by volunteering for a charity organization to go and give food to the homeless. What are they doing? Wallahi, it's dawah. Wallahi, it's work. It's a service to the deed. But we can't discount them. They're good people. They're, serving, they're giving service. I know scholars whom nobody knows of who are busy working in the prisons, serving those who are incarcerated. Some of you might have been in the prisons to visit such people. Or you might have been those people who were visited. Right? It happens. Didn't you appreciate when someone came to you and said, hey, listen, we're part of the Ummah, we care for you. We're just here. This is a Quran. Read this. Let's talk to you about the story of Yusuf alayhi salam. Let's reach out. What else do you want? Would you like us to go and give a message to so-and-so or do this or do that? See your well-being. Wallahi, it's amazing. It's amazing. This is the way the Ummah will succeed. When all of us care for each other, respect each other, honor each other, and we all make the most of the opportunities Allah has given us, the energy that Allah has given us. Allah has given you a brain, a capacity. It's not going to last forever. We must make use of it. May Allah Almighty grant us goodness. May Allah bless our children. May Allah bless all of us. May Allah Almighty grant victory to our brothers and sisters in Palestine. May Allah help them and be there for them. May Allah use us to help them. May Allah Almighty truly use us to help them in whatever way we can help them. And may Allah Almighty grant us all goodness. 
my brothers and sisters remain steadfast this deen the deen of Allah is the biggest favor you have it is more valuable than a very very expensive diamond just like you would look after this and make sure no one steals it be careful your deen what does it have what does Islam have I can tell you what it has it has connection with your maker and service to those whom he has made it has in it great values and morals very beautiful teachings teachings that will result in you and in yourself becoming a very beautiful leader of your family your society your community because you know what you've led a clean life imagine you follow the Islamic rules you don't drink you don't consume that which is harmful you don't steal and cheat you, you do good things you have great morals and values you don't commit adultery you don't gamble and you don't the nightlife is not part of what you engage in besides prayer at night and good things at night you don't do the bad things at night all of that what does it help you to become become an amazing person you sleep early you get up early you're working hard you're earning so much and you know what you will have a lot more money than those who are addicted to all sorts of things may Allah protect us from bad addictions may Allah help those who are struggling with addictions to heal may Allah Almighty help us to spread the good word of the Deen of Allah to all and make us encourage one another when you care about someone Allah will take care of you too and may Allah Almighty give me the ability to come back to Palmer's Green at some point inshallah أقول قولي هذا وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته